I'd like to welcome everybody to day two. We had a fabulous day yesterday and we're looking for another fun and informative day today. So thank you also to Aria and Canadian Real Estate Association of America for collaborating with our, com our committee for this great road trip and um, trade mission. So Lisa, may I ask you to join in please? Hi, good morning, everybody. My name is Lisa E. I'm the Vice Chair of Global Business Alliance Committee with Orange County Realtors. And I'm happy that you guys are all tuning, tuning back in today as a, our uh, day two of Canada Trade Mission and day three of our Global Business Week. And um, I love to see you guys coming back for next year. And hopefully you guys will enjoy today's presentation. And don't forget to stay for the networking. Thank you. Okay, so I'd like to get us started with our um, video with our local economist. I'd like to introduce Stephen Thomas, a California real estate broker with decades of real estate experience and a degree in quantitative economics and decision sciences from the University of California, San Diego. He developed reports on housing in 2004 and is considered an expert in real estate housing trends. Reports on housing has been utilized and quoted by Orange County, Los Angeles, San Diego newspapers, the Wall Street Journal, Fortune, USA Today, Bloomberg, local and national TV reporters, and several major talk show radio station blogs and internet news sites. So please um, enjoy the update video by Stephen Thomas. Thank you. Please tell me that there is actual audio this time. <laughs> Apologize for that, but let's get right into the housing debrief. This is what it's all about. We're in the midst of a summer market. Uh, it is summer, half the, half the year is pretty much done. Uh, we went through the winter market doldrums and then got into the spring market. Everything was good for like a hot minute. It was also really hot at the very beginning of the year. And now we're moving on to summer and of course, the heat, even though it's getting warmer outside, is beginning to, uh, as far as the heat, the heat index for uh, the housing market, it is really starting to cool. But um, let's go ahead and uh, share the screen and let's get going on this. And here we are. All right. So uh, I'm inviting everybody to like and subscribe. Please go to YouTube uh, and navigate over there and like and subscribe. The more that we do that, the more that we get real good solid data, a real, uh, a real good narrative that's based on sound facts and data rather than just conjecture. There's so much that's out there. So there's pl plenty of noise. Let's skip right through it. Let's get right into some funny, uh, a couple funny slides. Mary, the, the house, date the rate. So uh, already, if you if you locked in and you uh, are going to be closing on a rate that is at five and a, and a quarter percent, we were at five point two eight percent a week ago last Monday, and the interest rates already are considerably down less than that, about a half a percent less. So that's what they mean by marry the house, date the rate, because you can always refinance down the road when and if. Interest, interest rates go down again. We're just not gonna see them go down, do not have the expectations that go down to the threes or anything along those lines, but we can see them slowly but surely come down in the future. So um, that's one, marry the house, date the rate. How about this one, still renting? I can help. If cauliflower can somehow become pizza, you, my friend, can become a homeowner. I thought that was great. <laughs> People ask me, when's the best time to uh, to purchase? Well, if you're asking that question, you're not really ready to purchase. You should be. You should go in as soon as you're comfortable with the payment on a monthly basis, knowing that you have a good job, good credit, and money in the bank, so that you can uh, that you can make this thing happen. So, uh, housing buyers market in 2022. That is the big question. Are we going to have a buyers market in 2022? And um, it, I, before I was saying, ah, it doesn't, it looks like we're just moving our way towards balance. But now with the recent uh, change in interest rates, now that we're absorbing them and seeing what the numbers look like, it's looking like we're going to hit buyer's market territory. And I'll explain what that means to the overall marketplace. 
And yes, the market is continuously cooling down. I, it cool, it's cooling from week to week and month to month. There is a big giant change. I will show you exactly what I mean by that. If you see this, this is the expected market time year over year. This is if you place your home on the market today, when are we going into escrow? And you can see uh, that on March 17th, we were at 24 days. And that's the orange line. The orange line today, we're at 61 days. And within the last two weeks alone, it went up 11 days for all of Southern California. So we were at a 50 day expected market time two weeks ago. Here we are today, we're at a 61 day expected market time. So that's above the 60 day threshold. And I'll get into what that means if you remember from last week, but I'll get into what that means in a, in a moment. You can see that last year at this time, we were at 29 days. The difference between last year and this year is growing larger and larger and larger as this year progresses. And this will continue to be the story for the rest of this year. The three-year average is 71 days. That used to feel way off in the distance, but now at 61 days, we're knocking on the doors of, th of the three-year average. As a matter of fact, we will be going above the three-year average later on this year. So, and this three-year average that I talk about is 2017 through 2019. It was prior to COVID. So 2017 to 2019. And the market you could feel is really starting to slow. And uh, you could see that in the expected market time year over uh, year over year. This is uh, since I started tracking in 2012. I've been tracking it in Orange County since 2004. But um, you could see this spike. What I just what I just pointed to this spike right here. That spike. You could see how how steep it is. We're not used to those steep spikes. We did have a steep spike uh, another time, and that was when we had initially those uh, COVID lockdowns there was a giant spike and that was when everything came to a standstill still we still had inventory that actually were, uh, fell a little bit uh, at the very beginning but demand really fell down to levels that we hadn't seen since the great recession so uh we've also done it before we did it in at the end of 2018 we saw the expected market time grow because we had interest rates that went all the way up towards five percent and uh, so those are the last two times that we really spiked. Uh, we also spiked over here. You could see how it started the year, this is 2013, and it kept on getting long, higher and higher and higher. That was all of 2013. We're doing that again this time, but it's actually at a steeper grade than it was in 2013. And that's just because we have gone up quite a bit in interest rates even more than 2018, more than 2013. It's the largest increase since uh, uh, 1981. And, <clears throat> but to keep in mind where we are at, we, you've got to look at these number where, where, where uh, the, the different market times are to know the velocity and speed of the market. And when things are selling like an auction way over the asking price. Well, and we're still seeing that. I'm still even seeing that in what the closed data is right now today. But the stuff that's being opened right now, that's what I'm interested in seeing what happens to the sales to list price ratio because we're right now still the stuff that's closing is still about two and a half percent above the asking price. But uh, that is a lot of froth that's still left in the system and it's things that close that went into escrow in uh, May and in April that are closing right now uh, within the last uh, couple of weeks. And I was taking a look at those, those numbers and sure, sure enough, it's still a little bit high, but that is going to wane slowly but surely. It's, it's going to diminish. But between this 40 and 60, that is where we're at a hot seller's market. So we were, in, we're right now, uh, we were in a hot seller's market within the last couple of weeks and we've actually gone above that hot seller's market. So I said we were no longer insane. Now we're no longer a hot seller's market for the market in general for all of Southern California. And between 60 and 90 days, this area, this is where it is a slight seller's market. And we've behaved here in many, many different times of the, of the year. It's typically reserved for the second half of the year, but uh, there have been other markets like in 2019, when we came out of those 5% interest rates, we had too many homes on the market, not too many, but we had more homes on the market so that it took a little bit longer to absorb. And we had a slight seller's market at the very beginning of 2019, even during the springtime. Now above uh, that, 
uh, 90 day threshold all the way to 120 is what we refer to as a balanced market. That is from three months to four months. That's where there's not a lot going on as far as appreciation or depreciation or anything along those lines. It's where buyers and sellers have to figure it out and kind of come to an agreement. And uh, both of them need to compromise as to uh, in, enable to put together a uh, transaction and go into escrow and go under contract. Above 120 to 150 is a slight buyer's market area. And that is where I think we're going to end up. We ended up there for a hot minute before. You could see kind of like in, in the middle over here, you can see this right over here. This area right here is definitely a slight buyer's market, but we were only there for a minute. And that's not long enough to do any kind of... Uh, uh, damage to pricing or if prices do not go down when you're only up there for a minute. And that sometimes happens at the very end of the year. And then that's what happened at the end of 2018. And then interest rates got uh, better really fast, went from 5% down to 4% in a matter of moments. And then you got this big slide in the expected market time. Now, uh, above, oh, by the way, above, above that 150, above 150 is a deep buyer's market. And uh, you have to be way above it for it to come down like it did in the Great Recession. Uh, and I'll show you that with an Orange County chart in a minute. Uh, but where are the, where is the expected market time going to go? You can see from here, we're just going to keep on continuing to go up until we get to, gosh, a slight seller's market is what it appears. So I want to show you March versus today in all markets. Los Angeles went from 30 to a 64-day expected market time there right now for Los Angeles County as a whole is a slight seller's market. That doesn't mean that I, I've seen some, some of the markets are slower than, than other markets, but overall it is what is referred to as a slight seller's market. Orange County, it went from 20 to 56 days. It's 56 days right now, almost at a slight seller's market. Riverside knocking on the door of slight sellers went from 21 to 59. Um, San Bernardino went from 28 to 73, definitely in a slight seller's market and actually making their way. They will be the first to enter a balanced market, uh, probably sometime by the end of the summer. San Diego went from 18 to 55 days. And Ventura is a little bit hot. I had a number last time, but then we had to correct it. It's actually went from 20 to 43 days. There is not a lot though. They only have like uh, less than a thousand homes on the market. But it is a it's it's been slowing down just like all all other markets have been slowing down. So, but I don't want anybody to be fearful of the of, of the term buyers market, and especially buyers. Of course, they're not going to be. But this whole thing about waiting until it's like the perfect time to purchase. It, it, good luck on timing uh, anything. I I will explain what I'm what I mean by a slight buyers market in a second, and I I can't definitively tell you uh, when and if. Uh, prices will come down if at all. Uh, but it's I, I really want to remove the fear out of this by bringing you real hard stats. The, it, we're not looking at a crash. We're definitely not looking at a giant bubble that is going to explode and we're going to go down 20, 30%. That is what it means by a bubble. I mean, when people say that it's going down 3%, that it's slowly leaking a bubble, well, then it's not really a bubble, right? Because uh, if it pops, it absolutely pops. And as far as a where we're going, it's probably a slight buyer's market where if you're priced right and it's a good looking property, that thing is going to fly off of the market. So as far as the uh, expected market time uh, where where we are at for Orange County, this is I did those same yellow lines, but you can see, man, they're all scrunched down. The reason they're scrunched down is because there was a glut of homes on the market. I'm showing you this hot seller's market, slight seller's balance, slight buyer's market, and deep buyer's market. And you can see that it hasn't really been there for a super long time. And where was it before? It was over here. This was the Great Recession. That's where there were 18,000 homes on the market. And right now, there are about 3,400 homes on the market. That's when there were 120,000 homes on the market in all of Southern California. And right now, they're making their way towards, you know, trying to get towards 40,000. And I'll get into exactly where we are in just a moment. But home values, where are they going to go? Well, you need to be, in order for them to go down, you need to be in buyer's market territory above 120 days for a, for a duration. And what that means is for a lengthy period of time, not for a month, not for two months. It's going to have to be several months. And remember, homeowners are sitting in a very awesome spot 
as far as this is not like the Great Recession. The homeowners have a lot of equity. They got great jobs, good credit. They're not going to be like dumping their homes uh, and and uh, panic selling. So there's going to be a stickiness to pricing. So uh, just know that it will come down a little bit if we're in that uh, above four month expected market time for quite some time. And that's what we'll be watching. It needs to be up there for about four to six months. And this is where that 120 line is and where we are right now. We have to go way above it. We are probably going to get there by the end of the year. However, towards the end of the year, we start off a whole brand new year in 2023 and there will be different metrics and everything else. And we won't definitively know because we have a progression model that we won't know until we get to about September what the start of next year is going to look like. So this all comes down to supply and demand. We have more supply on the market right now because demand has been falling with higher rates. So that slows the market. But I want to thank our sponsor. Our sponsor is the uh, Thibodeau Morel Group at JMJ Financial. It's uh, Jason Thibodeau. Uh, thanks for your sponsorship once again. Uh, you can contact him at 714-330-8263. And they have this earnest money deposit uh, protection program that is uh, where they can protect your, your, your money. Uh, for, a, for a small fee. And what they'll do is that if something happens, it'll cover your earnest money deposit and they'll do this from property to property. So this is just a program where if you're feeling a little sketchy and, and uh, wanna make sure that you can get your earnest money deposit back, they have a program for that, as well as a lock and shop mortgage thing where you can lock it. And especially right now, excuse me, with rates that have come down to where they are right, right now today, you might wanna lock something and shop. So you can contact them for that as well. <clears throat> excuse me. So you, uh, the, the, the uh, Thibodeau uh, Morel Group, uh, their methodology is simple. We don't make promises we can't keep. So they're going to tell you the real hard facts, the way that we like to do business, of course. So you can contact Jason Thibodeau with JMJ Financial by calling 714-330-8263. That's 714-330-8263. Uh, now back to the program. As far as that supply and demand is concerned, well, let's talk about supply. This is where inventory is right now. And you can see it's been kind of going up at a pretty substantial uh, pace and it is going to continue to go up uh, this year. And you can see it right here that this is uh, quite the uh, quite the incline, kind of looks like that rocket ship. It's going up uh, today. It's at 26,895, making our way towards 30, eventually making our way towards 40. It's went up 15% or 3,555 homes in a two week period of time. I checked and it's actually, it's the largest rise this year, but it's also the largest rise since tracking began a decade ago. It beat out a one of the, the numbers that I saw in 2013, which was right at right below 3,000 and within the last two weeks up 3,555. The highest level uh, since July 2020. That's the last time we were at this level. So we're making our way back to right at the beginning. Uh, well, right after we came out of the uh, lockdown situation of COVID. And this will continue to go up until it surpasses all of 2020 as well. We've surpassed 2021. It's going to surpass 2020 and make its way towards 2019. Last year, we were at 18,449, which is 31% less than where we are today. Nearly uh, 8,500 homes less. Three-year average is 40,356. We're making our way towards average. This was double, and now it's only 50% higher. It only We only have to go a little, uh, just about less than 14,000 homes to get to where we were in 2019. So we're making our way towards that. We're going to rocket our way and probably surpass 2019 levels sometime during the fall. And as far as demand is concerned, well, Demand has a lot to do with interest rates and interest rates got all the way up to six and a quarter percent. And here we are today at 5.88. Actually, it's 5.75 percent. I should. Uh, that was I just checked it right now is at 5.75 percent. So we're already at five and three quarters coming down a full half percent. And the last time we saw uh, rates at this level was November of 2008. So we're just not used to seeing these high interest rates. And this is having an impact on demand. And the Federal Reserve, I need to let you know what the Federal Reserve said because they were meeting with Congress. Uh, Jerome Powell was meeting with Congress and he has more to say about housing. And he wasn't 
they didn't say a lot about housing, but now they're answering questions where they're saying quite a bit about housing and, and exactly what their method, methodology is behind slowing down housing that by uh, slowing down the demand side of the equation. So, so interest rate, interest sensitive spending is a very important aspect of how our tools work. This is in response to housing and, and it's slowing down. He also said, in the case of the housing market, what you are seeing is higher mortgage rates. So you're actually seeing demand move down quite significantly. I think that I think what you will see or many forecasts call for the increases in housing prices to slow pretty significantly now. What we hope is we can get demand, that part of the economy, to slow to a more sustainable pace and get the housing market back on a more sustainable path where there is a balance between supply and demand. So this is two weeks in a row where he's been talking about the housing market to a point where you now definitively know what they're trying to do. They're trying to slow down demand so that the supply will increase and then down the road when interest rates come down, we'll have a more even supply and demand equation rather than no supply and too much demand. And it was uh, today where, as far as demand concerns, the last 30 days with the contract activity, it's at 13,125. It went down 7% or nearly 1,000 homes. It was the largest drop of the year so far. And that was absorbing these higher rates, even at five and three quarters percent. This is higher than where we were at prior to the, the consumer price index. Last year, we were at 46% higher than where we are today, nearly not over 19,000 extra escrows. And three-year average is 17,252, which is 31% higher. So demand is muted. Right now, the muted demand is being pit with muted uh, inventory, but as that inventory continues to go up, it's going to continuously slow down the marketplace. And as far as where we're going to go from here, we kind of are absorbing those five and three quarters plus interest rates, and it will remain muted and subdued for the rest of the year. We're moving towards balance, or we're moving, and, and then after that, we are going to be moving towards a slight buyer's market. And so that you can feel that the market is shifting, it is slowing, and it really does talk about the importance of pricing. There are so many overpriced properties that are out there right now expecting the market to behave like it did during 2021 and 2022. And this is from Altos Research. And as of uh, Monday, so it was all of last week, the price reductions were at 27.2% of all of uh, everything that was available on the market in the United States. SoCal right now, I just did the numbers, is at 32%. So it is definitely... Uh, there are a lot of price reductions in the system and this will continue to increase like it has been from week to week to week because of the importance of pricing initially out of the box. So I just want everybody to know I'm going to be dark in the month of July. I'm actually not going to have a report next Thursday. I'm going to go dark for the rest of July. I have vacations planned with the family. It's time to enjoy and not do as many presentations. And that's what this is all about. Kids are, kids are only young for so long. So I'm going to be enjoying the summer with them and we'll be back in August. So stay tuned for the announcements for that. If you want a copy of this, you need to be a subscriber of the housing report. We'll automatically send you one. And you just go to reportsonhousing.com. You click on subscribe. And uh, you, you know, there's plenty of reports that all over Southern California. We're working on the Bay Area report right now. And it's $15 per month or $150 per year. You get a month free if you utilize the coupon code BUYERS. And the last one that came out was Summer Slowdown. San Bernardino Riverside just got theirs this week. And Orange County, Los Angeles, and San Diego will get a brand new one this coming up week. And we have a new free content section within Reports on Housing Com. Go there as well to see it. It's, it's, there's some free stuff for you to download and utilize. So that's all I have for you. I, oh, I hope you guys have a fantastic weekend. I do have some special guests that I want to bring here. Who are my special guests? Hello. Who's this? Alana. Alana, Alana. and Luna. This is very good. Yes, this is uh, Luna, a special guest. We haven't seen her since the beginning of COVID when she was a tiny little puppy. And now she's been with us for, gosh, two and a half years. About. Pretty cool. Right on. Who else do we have? I feel like fingers behind my back. Who else is, is, is here? <laughs> Hi. It's Mason. How are we doing, Mason? Good. You know, it's kind of warm. We should probably jump in a pool. Does that sound like a good idea? Yeah. I think we'll do that. That's what we'll do. Right on. Who do we have here? 
Uh, I have a, a very, very special guest. Uh, this looks like the, a worm from the bottom of a tequila bottle. Hey! Oh. <laughs> hey! Hi, guys! <laughs> wow, she's going to bring all the entertainment to my Get out of my tube <laughs> here. I mean, who doesn't like JoJo Siwa bows, sombrero hats, messy hair, and these weird sparkly thingies? <laughs> I love it. So, see ya. Have a great day. July, and we'll see you in August when my birthday is because my birthday's in 48 days. All right. Hi, Mia, you want to say hello to the masses? <laughs> we do have somebody that's going to be a junior in high school, so we're a little reluctant to come on the camera, but right on. Thanks for coming on the camera and letting everybody know that you're here. Anything special you have to say? Nope. All right. On that. You know what? She has been to a lot of my uh, a lot of my presentations recently, so she's seen my shtick over and over again. <laughs> but anyways, thank you so much. Have a fantastic uh, finish your week, a fantastic weekend, and we'll see everybody. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say thank you, Joyce and Lisa, for the uh, for the updates and the market overview from the Orange County market. That was very interesting. And uh, well, let's hope that we are not going to be, uh, you know, stick on this uh, buyer's market for too long. You know, interest rates coming back down, hopefully sometimes tomorrow, uh, not tomorrow, but uh, next year. But uh, anyway, so it is now my pleasure to get our program going. So today we will be focusing on pre-sale, uh, the side of the uh, real estate in, uh, industries in the British Columbia. So we will start with the uh, presentations on the pre-sale process and then take a look at the pre-sale across the province. So obviously there's two topics that we're gonna touch on, the legal overviews of the pre-sale purchases in uh, British, uh, British Columbia and then the pre-sale uh, by Richard Bells that I'm going to introduce shortly and then followed by pre-sale market overview in British Columbia. So uh, it is my pleasure to invite Richard Bell and uh, <clears throat> excuse, excuse me, um, Richard is the partner from Bell Alliance LLP in Vancouver who is a very good friend of mine and a founding member uh, of the ARIA Vancouver as well. And he will be uh, in touch on the considerations for pre-sale by international buyers. So Richard, the floor is all yours. Thanks very much. Um, so Vancouver market is experiencing the same things that every place else in the world is. Um, but I thought I would start the presentation by sort of explaining why uh, Vancouver is a uh, popular spot. You know, let me uh, show you what I see out my window here. So uh, this is what Vancouver looks like, um, which is a, a pretty nice place to live and, and a hot spot for investors on pre-sales. So, uh, Projects here on pre-sale, about 75% of the sales are actually to investors. Um, they look at a product that they can, uh, that has been priced at today's value with a bit of an anticipated increase. Uh, by the time the project is finished, uh, three years later in the high-rise properties, um, there's been this consistent increase in, in valuations. Uh, so, the market has slowed even on pre-sales, but it's, uh, it still is a place that investors are flocking to. Uh, and one of the reasons they continue to flock to it is that rents are high and Vancouver and the lower mainland likely to go higher. Uh, many of you probably participated in discussion around immigration yesterday. Um, and there is, uh, Canada is uh, inviting more immigrants into the country than historically they ever have done. Uh, those immigrants will likely be going to the two major centers in the country, which are Vancouver and Toronto. Uh, some go to uh, Montreal as well, but uh, Toronto and Vancouver are the biggest attractors, uh, both with strong tech centers. So we, uh, we expect the uh, pre-sale market by investors will continue and, and you'll see some stats coming up in the next presentation. 
So a couple of things to, that you have to be a little bit conscious about around uh, pre-sales um, is you do, when someone enters into a pre-sale contract, there's actually in, in British Columbia, a seven day rescission period. So it allows everyone to uh, retain the services of a lawyer to review uh, the contract documentation, uh, which uh, you can imagine is pretty extensive uh, disclosure statement as well as the, the contract. Uh, and you're looking for a couple of things when you're reviewing that contract. There are often provisions in the contract that allow for the developer to delay the construction. So they may have an anticipated date of completion, but due to labor shortages or uh, as we're all aware, supply management issues, uh, they can push out the contracts for a fairly lengthy period of time. There are circumstances where uh, the developer can decide to terminate the contract. So you really need to, when you're looking at pre-sales, make sure you do seek the advice of someone who works in the contract for pre-sale uh, piece of the practice of the law, because some of the contracts are quite uh, onerous in favor of for the developer. So you've really got to understand what the, the contract language potentially could do. Um, the contract will have restrictions on your ability to assign the contract. You would require the consent of the developer. Um, and in the process of them consenting, they will likely charge you a fee. That fee can range significantly from a sort of what effectively is an administration fee, or in some instances, they can basically sort of analyze what the current value of the property is and take a percentage of what they perceive as the lift amount and the increased value from what you bought when you signed a contract three years ago to what it is today. So you really have to be careful, careful with that. We have seen projects where the developer simply says, you know what? I can't meet this outside date because normally the contracts will have a, a date that says, here's when we expect completion to take place, but we have this outside date. And due to supply management issues and labor shortages, they may hit that outside date, but decide what they're going to do is cancel all the contracts. I do expect we'll see some legislation in the not too distant future that will prevent that from happening, but currently, uh, the developer has the ability to cancel contracts in certain circumstances. There are contracts which allows a buyer to also cancel the contract. But one of the challenges we've seen over the years, especially where a developer decides to cancel the contract, is that a buyer steps in uh, to buy a property at a certain price. The developer ultimately, because of delays and everything, decides to cancel that contract. Now, all of a sudden, that buyer can't afford to buy into what that market looks like two or three years down the road. So again, it just speaks to how important it is that you don't just blindly assume that the fine print is, is, is fine. Um, it could have some real onerous provisions in it. One of the things that uh, just we talk particularly for uh, uh, people that are gonna occupy is you, you gotta watch what sort of parking stall you're getting. Uh, because there are big parking stalls, there are good parking stalls, uh, there are bad parking stalls. And so we often suggest to our clients that in fact specify that they do get a regular parking stall. Uh, there's price adjustments clauses sometimes in the contracts. This is a relatively new thing that we've seen. Uh, it just seems that lawyers acting for developers are uh, trying to uh, tip the scales more and more in favor of, of the developer. One of the things we always sort of recommend is just look at who the developer is, uh, you know, especially in, in changing markets and supply issues. You, I can assure you that the developers that have a long track record and have uh, good uh, relationships with their suppliers, they'll have priority over getting things done on time and getting whatever uh, supply issues are causing problems, trying to work their way around that. So we've seen situations uh, in terms of these cancellation of contracts, they tend to be 
the developers that perhaps do not have a long track record in the industry. Um, so what's the number one thing? Uh, Pre-sales are very, very popular uh, with uh, investors. As I say, over 75% of the uh, purchasers are developers. And I know that because uh, most of the developers use technology that I developed to uh, eliminate paper from the process. So we are able to track uh, literally minute minute to minute what's happening on projects across Canada. Uh, the other thing is, you know, uh, look to the track record of a developer. Uh, that's important. Uh, but pre-sales, as I say, are a great investment for investors. Uh, now, I'm going to touch briefly on uh, the legislation around foreign buyers. I think for those that were on yesterday, yes, Heather Bell, who did a presentation on immigration, is my daughter. Uh, she works just down the hall, which is, uh, is kind of nice. Um, she probably talked a bit about the foreign buyers issues uh, and empty, uh, empty home taxes. Uh, right now in the city of Vancouver, uh, we have an empty home tax, which is basically uh, the government saying, we don't want units to sit empty because we want to make sure that people who own units either live in them or provide rental products to the marketplace. The province, uh, uh, Vancouver was the first city to do that. The province looked at that and said, hey, what a great way to earn some more money. So the province introduced a empty home tax. Um, then the feds just recently decided, gee, the city's got a great idea. The province has a great idea. We're going to introduce a federal uh, underused housing tax, is what they refer to. Uh, and again, they just don't want properties sitting empty. Uh, that federal legislation was introduced this year, but it's going to apply to underused housing in this year. And therefore, everybody who owns a property that is underused. Uh, we'll need to pay some taxes on it. So when you put the three together, you can end up anywhere from five to 9% of taxes on top of the fair market value of the property that's underused. Um, just recently, uh, the federal government also uh, announced a foreign buyer ban, which is effective January of 20, 2000, uh, 2023, and it's in place for two years. Again, it's just trying to address um, the crisis in the market. And I think, you know, for many of us, we've been around long enough to know that usually governments do some of these draconian measures when the market is already solving itself uh, and starting to slow down and prices coming off of it. And so, quite frankly, it drives me crazy when governments start stepping in when the market itself will uh, control it. In terms of the foreign buyer ban, uh, there are some exemptions to that. Um, you know, if someone's a foreign buyer, but their spouse is Canadian or permanent residents, then the tax doesn't apply. It won't apply to existing contracts. So we're getting calls nowadays where people are saying, you know what, I wasn't going to buy for a couple of years, but I think I'll buy uh, now to avoid uh, that foreign buyer, uh, foreign buyer tax as long as the contract is in place before the end of the year. People with work permits, uh, if they're existing work permits, they're fine as well, uh, as long as they're living in Canada. And there's a few other exemptions as well. If you go on bellalliance.ca, uh, we've just posted a blog on uh, dealing with those foreign buyers issues that the, the feds have done. So, uh, so really that's what I wanted to sort of talk about today. Uh, you know, pre-sales, uh, they are slowing down a bit, both in Toronto and Vancouver, which are sort of the two big markets in Canada for, for condos, uh, but it's still active uh, in spite of the interest rates and the predominant buyers. Our investors and the projects are taking basically three years before a high rise will actually be available for closing of a sale. So that's it for me, folks. Uh, feel free to come to Vancouver. Feel free to give us a, a call anytime you need some help. We do a lot of this work. And so it's my pleasure. Thank you so much, Richard. And uh, let's see if there's any questions uh, from any 
anyone's uh you know like uh, the attendees but i just want to um uh, just uh, one comment to add on is that the empty home tax is only for the city of Vancouver, right? So uh, if you buy in other city, like if whoever has been to Vancouver, the first city they're going to get in is the city of Richmond, okay? Where where uh, mostly is like a, uh, you know, like is a Chinese city. So uh, anywhere else that is outside the city of Vancouver, you don't have that empty home tax, correct? But then the That's... federal government, it comes with that 1%. Uh, so that will be something that Richard, I want to ask you is that, okay, so that 1% will be applying for the rest of the cities, correct? So, yeah, then... so it's, a, it's a federal, it's a national one, the federal yes. one's national. The Vancouver one is Vancouver. Uh, the provincial one, is most of the, the the larger towns like so it's the greater Vancouver, the greater Victoria. Uh, it doesn't include places like Squamish and Whistler and the Gulf Islands and, and all of that. So uh, each uh, Vancouver is the city. The province is not the entire province, but probably uh, seventy percent of the populated areas. And the federal one is national. Yes, and uh, so. Um... Colleen is asking, is that where uh, we can get this breakdown? Um, you know, like, it, do you have this on your website? Yeah, the, we just posted a blog just in advance of this so that everyone would be able to quickly go to bellalliance.ca and look at the latest blog. There's a number of other blogs in there. I know that the immigration team has posted a number of uh, blogs recently um, about uh, the federal government's targets for over 400 thousand new immigrants each year for the next three years, uh, particularly focusing on skilled workers. Mm -hmm. So do you find that, uh, you know, the taxation seems uh, oppressive? Sorry, what was that, Tina? Uh, there was one comment saying that taxation seems oppressive. Yeah, so you know, it, it drives, quite frankly, it drives me crazy. As I said earlier, it's the, the market ultimately controls itself. And quite frankly, I, I'm, I'm offended by the fact that uh, folks from the U.S., for example, are getting hit with these, yet uh, guess how many Canadians own property in Florida and Arizona and California? Uh, so somehow it just, you know, we're creating an unlevel playing field with what is our best partners in the world, right? So mm -hmm. I've had clients who you know, sold their properties here. They may have been coming to Vancouver in the summer. You saw the picture out my office. Uh, they may have been coming here for 20 years and they own a, a small condo and it's not a $10 million condo. It's a, you know, an $800,000 condo. And they would say, you know, when Vancouver did it, we just sort of, we were upset. But then when the province introduced it, they decided they've had enough if, you know, if, if the governments of Canada don't want us here, then we'll, stay on which is very unfortunate <laughs> yeah so lastly i want to um uh, add on to this that's the uh the governments the federal governments for that one percent on top you know for the whole country now for the city of vancouver our empty home tax right now is five percent of the assessed value now uh just to share with the uh orange county folks of california uh, or anybody's in the U.S. Like I, as far as I know, I only know that San Francisco. So once you own the, bought the house, if you just like uh, uh, 30 years ago, then you will add your property tax based on the price of the 30 years ago price, and then add 1.8 or 2 percent on top. But ours is different. Ours is like we have evaluation assessment every year. So, you know, like the value has been going up and down, but mostly, you know, the, the, the line is still going up. So these uh, assessed values, uh, the 5%, the city of Vancouver charged 5% of the assessed values of these, uh, you know, these properties in the city of Vancouver. Do you think that this extra 1% will add on top to make the city of Vancouver becomes like a 6%? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is all cumulative, right? That's why I mentioned you could, could be anywhere from five to nine percent, depending on which one you get you get hit with. And, but again, I think the other thing for people to remember is that you know investors renting out their property aren't affected by these taxes. Correct. Right. So it, you, you're only affected by the foreign buyer ban for a two-year period, starting as of January. So for most yeah. investors. Uh, they're not affected at all. It's having the summer place 
in Vancouver and you don't want to rent it out for at least 180 days out of the year. Uh, and again, what we're finding is people are saying, well, you know what, I, I don't want to be there uh, for a long period of time. So uh, I will rent it out for a period of time. Um, so, so that's, I think that's, it's really important to remember that this is, this is just right. for properties that are sitting empty for more than six months out of the year. Great. Thank you so much, Richard. Uh, if, uh, any other comments, questions, you know, from the audience that I want to ask? One, two, three. So we're going to go to our next, uh, uh, you know. Thanks like, so much, uh, everybody. Center. Thank you so much, Richard, and I really appreciate it. And uh, so uh, next one now is my pleasure to introduce Jackie Chen, uh, the founder and CEO of Baker West Real Estate uh, Incorporated in Vancouver. Uh, Jackie will share her, uh, his insight on pre-sale projects across the province. Jackie, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Tina. Uh, I'll just share my screen right now. A moment. There we go. Uh, thumbs up if you guys can can see everything well. Looks good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Kriya, and thank you, Aria. Um, so thank you, Tina's um, invite to to be a speaker um, at this event. Very exciting. Uh, very good information. Love to see all of you guys and. Uh, so I am here as an ambassador and uh, a, a salesperson for Vancouver and British Columbia um, as a whole. And Richard has shared some, you know, really great points um, with us. And I'm going to go over um, sort of the market and, and what Vancouver actually looks like and, and how it could be um, a very um, plausible, lucrative and, and, and uh, high potential investment or even relocation option um, for your clients um, from the state. So I'm Jackie Chan, CEO of Baker West Real Estate um, in Vancouver here. Today, we'll talk about um, the Metro Vancouver market, uh, Fraser Valley interior, which is the Okanagan and the Vancouver Island, which is all a part of uh, the British Columbia um, province. So who is Baker West? Originally, you know, there, there were 40 minutes set out for this presentation, but um, we got last minute notice that, um, you know, due to times, um, we, we have to cut it down to about 25 minutes. So uh, excuse me if I'm talking super fast um, and, you know, type your questions and, and, and I'll try to answer all of them. And, um, you know, for the stats, I will try to um, be as fast as possible and, and, and uh, as we had to cut down on some of the information. So Baker West is part of the largest pre-construction sales conglomerate in Canada. Um, in 2021 alone, um, we have done over $40 billion worth of sales in Canadian real estate alone. Um, we are a big group that operates nationally. So we have um, Baker Toronto, Baker Montreal, Baker West in Vancouver, Epic Solutions in Kelowna, which is the Okanagan, and the condo group, which has been rebranded to the Island Realm, which takes care of the Vancouver Island market. And we also own um, Sotheby's International Realty Canada nationally. And we're also the largest um, investor equity owner and operator of Sotheby's International Realty um, in the world. And, and we operate a lot of them in, in the United States as well. So in total, we, we have about you know, 1,800 agents right now. And each year we do about 22,000 um, ends of the transaction of listing and buying, just so that you guys have an idea. And we, we have been in operation for over 40 years now. Um, and I take care of the, the Western Canada operation. So, you know, we, we have a lot of um, technology that we use in terms of the My Baker app and, and the online portal, which allows brokers um, who, who are uh, our sales partners to access all the project data um, that we have. I mean, at any given point in time, um, nationally, we have 
over 100 active projects that we are selling. Uh, and these are pre-sale, pre-construction projects. And some of them, we take it to um, the temple sales, which is, you know, after, you know, the, the launch has happened, we, we continue the sales all the way, even after completion. Um, we also have a Baker reporting system, which, which allows our clients uh, brokers slash realtors and buyers to um, get a lot of our information on our projects in different markets. Um, we have the iBaker sales app, which allows our clients and realtors to um, process transactions and, and contracts uh, digitally anywhere in the world um, through, through our app. And, and same goes for um, the Baker online sales. So, I mean, this is just an overview, you know, um, our clients, which, which are some of the more major developers, I mean, from small to the largest ones, um, they hire us to, to make markets, to beat, beat records um, by adding value, premium pricing, velocity, um, building brand and recognition, um, and, and to build the customer satisfaction. So without further ado, we will get into um, the explanation and, and some of the trends and data of the market, Metro Vancouver. So this is a map of, of um, uh, the area that we're that is most active in British Columbia. We are sitting right here in Vancouver. So um, this is Metro Vancouver, and this is the Fraser Valley. This is the Okanagan's interior, and this is the Vancouver Island. All of this, it's actually um, within the province of British Columbia. Now I'll go through these markets one by one um, so you guys can, can understand how it, how it works. Right now, this square, it's a, it's a zoom in snapshot of the Metro Vancouver area with the projects that Baker West is actively um, uh, marketing and selling. Um, one of them, it's one park. In, in Richmond, these are the sub municipalities and, and cities within Metro Vancouver. Sun Towers in Burnaby, um, Revive and W63 in the Vancouver West Side and Hudson 8. And then we have um, the Curve, which is my background here, um, showcasing uh, a very exciting project that, that I'll talk to you guys about in, in more details. So why Vancouver? Vancouver, it's the third most livable and third greenest city in the world. Um, for Canada, we, we have been granted roughly, you know, 400,000 uh, permanent residency um, since 2021, which um, Richard has already shared with us. This is the highest number um, that we have seen in immigration since 1913. So it's actually been over 110 years that we have actually exceeded the immigration of over 350,000. This is very significant because this is a never been seen before number of immigration into Canada as a country as a whole. So this is this will happen five years in a row. So 400,000 um, plus or minus times five gives us two million two, two million immigrants. And, and that equates to at the current population of 38 million in Canada. That represents an increase of population of um, 5.26% for the entire country. And as Richard has already mentioned, a lot of these uh, uh, immigrants will go to um, British Columbia and Ontario, which is the east, eastern side of, of, of um, the nation. However, um, because of its because of Vancouver's and British Columbia's um, geographic advantages, because of the weather, um, because of, of, of its, its tech um, centric. Uh, business boom and because of you know it being the only one of the only places in the world where you can fish and wakeboard and wick surf and ski in the same day within a one hour transportation you know there, there's not many other the different places in the world where it's right by the water, but right by the Pacific Ocean, where you can have also the world class um, skiing and and wineries, you know, at, at the ski mountains and 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 the interiors. So this this is a very important aspect of Vancouver. I mean, it's 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 actually quite similar to um, 
you know, California, places in California. And then I'll talk about that in a little bit in terms of uh, similarities with, you know, Okanagan with the Napa Valleys and things like that. But um, it is also one of the very rare cities in the world where doesn't matter what ethnicity you are or which country you come from, you don't have to speak a word of English to be able to thrive in this city. You can, you can, you know, I, we, I know so many clients and business um, acquaintances and associates that, you know, does not speak a word of English and they, they can still run very big businesses because we are very multicultural and very diverse and very accepting of, you know, uh, different backgrounds. And uh, Vancouver is currently viewed as uh, definitely a world, world-class city. And because of the immigration, I mean, a lot of the, the, the fundamentals and a lot of the, the uplift and the, and the increasing trend will be fueled by these 400,000 um, immigrants uh, times five years. Because thinking back, you know, in 1913, that was that population of 350,000 that came from Europe, you know, um, in Germany, um, England, and and and. Italy and other places of uh, Europe has pretty much shaped the, the history of Canada. Now we're repeating that for five years in a row. So what benefits that will have economically and how that will, you know, really affect the real estate market for Vancouver, it's it's literally unknown. But what we know is going back to the basics of supply and demand, you know, if supply stays the same and demand increases, we've already seen a graph earlier, there's only one place to go for the price, which is up. So uh, Vancouver market fundamental 101, BC market fundamentals are as strong as ever, offering a strong value proposition over the long-term horizon. Since the early 1990s, there has been a solid appreciation of up to six to 10% every year, year after year. And buyers are now enjoying an improved balanced market and greater choices dual to all of these government interventions, taxes, foreigner buyers control, which is really like Richard said, you know, it's 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 un, not so welcome in, 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 in the real estate industry, but at the same time, you know, it is obviously trying to suppress um, a market that it's, bound to be, you know, sort of uncontrollable if we if we left it to it, its natural state. And the 1990s um, time period is, is very significant because that was the last period of the Asia exodus. You know, if you guys remember, you know, Hong Kong, 1997, the handover of Hong Kong back to China and, and you know, the relationship between Taiwan and mainland China. Um, that feel the rocket ship of the Vancouver real estate market. Now this is happening again, um, and it's sort of re history repeating on its own, but on steroids times ten. Um, so that's 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 what we will anticipate right now. So this is a graph that shows the historical data starting from 1977 um, in in different sectors of real estate. Blue line represents a detached. Um, yellow condominium, and then red is the attached, which is your condos and and um, townhomes, and uh, and then and then the green one, it, it's apartment. And so when you can see here, these are uh, uh, in thousand. So so in in the early 1990s, when the exodus happened. You know, in the late 1980s, that's really what um, um, started the Vancouver market started to trend up because everyone started to come, you know, the immigration. And it started to take off, um, you know, a, a, an average home would be at the price of, and this is detached, which means um, single family homes, um, was, you know, even below 200000 $200,000 for a single detached family. And now... The same product, it's looking at, um, you know, over $2 million. And th this is the average. Now, you see this dip here at the very end. This is this is um, sort of the, 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 the first quarter of 2022. So the first two quarters. And because of the, the new budget that was announced and, and the uncertainties uh, regarding the controls of foreign buyer tax and, and the increasing of the interest rate, um, it has it has the increase has tapered off 
um, but only for a very short period of time because because it's just you know speculators or even users are waiting to see okay what's going to happen um, and and so right now there are actually a lot of good deals and as you can see the historical trend um, this is one of the bigger dips um, that we have experienced. And, and very soon, as soon as the immigrants that are approved and, and the permanent residents and the work permits that are approved are landing in Canada, which you know we have an expected number of actually 700,000 people landing in Canada this year, it's, it's really gonna um, change the trajectory. Now I now I go into uh, the couple specific markets. So if you remember the map, this is this is downtown Vancouver. Um, I will try to you know speed through this. I was going to talk about this in much more details, but downtown Vancouver basically represents the financial district. But in Vancouver, it's very unique because we do have a very um, prominent residential component to our downtown, unlike many other cities in the world, because our downtown is sort of a, a mini peninsula with um, it's surrounded by by water. So, so sort of think, um, you know, Manhattan, um, but more residential, uh, more residentially driven. So, um, you know, it's in the green light status right now. Um, and for a fourth consecutive quarter, sales has increased by 27% compared to last quarter. Um, one of the most high-end projects that has been brought um, through the market um, has brought local end users and int international buyers down back to the downtown market uh, by Boza Properties at 1515. And uh, the first quarter, we saw 30% uh, of the availability was absorbed by the market with an 8% increase um, compared to the last quarter. So these are just some, um, you know, ballpark prices for references. So a one bedroom in downtown Vancouver is going for about a million dollars, two bedroom, 1.65 million, and three bedroom, it's 2.2 million. And these are in Canadian dollars. Okay, so you guys would, uh, in, in the States would have to uh, divide that by about 1.35, just so that, you know, you, you're not too shocked by these numbers. <laughs> but but with Vancouver right now, we do have one of the highest um, price per square foot um, in real estate in the world. I think right now we're, we're still sitting at second or third place between Hong Kong, Vancouver, and Sydney, um, Australia. And these are the monthly rental rates. So we're sitting at about, you know, a 2.5 to 3% um, cap rental return. Um, the higher the price, the lower the, the, the rental return usually. This is the Vancouver West Side. Um, in general, this is a more high end um, residential neighborhood. So think, you know, um, um, Hollywood, Beverly Hills um, type of neighborhood. And, and these are more of the, the, the condo um, market, which is, you know, 850,000, one bed, two bed, three bed with the corresponding rent. Now, first quarter 2022, um, we saw, you know, a close to 400 sales with a 20% decrease um, from the previous quarter. Um, and demand for new projects still remains strong. Five projects have launched through the quarter, um, adding 400 um, sales to the market with an absorption rate of about 60%. So this is predominantly a user-driven market um, where it, we have the, the best schools, the public schools, and we have the best private schools as well. This is a, a especially popular area historically for um, Asian immigrants from Hong Kong, Taiwan, and mainland China, and also the United States as well. Um, so between downtown and, and, and west side, this has been the most um, affluent and, and sought after um, neighborhood. But it, it has softened up um, in the last little bit because the prices has went up so high, you know, hit historically. So there's there's definitely room um, to to pick out some uh, good products here for for your clients. This is Burnaby, um, and it's part of um, the the Metro Vancouver area as well. I won't go into too much details for Burnaby because it's it's actually quite similar to the rest of Vancouver. Um, there has been a lot of supply. In, um, in, in new development of massive scale, um, you know, 10 towers at one time um, with different um, very 
large developers. And in the past five years, the absorption has been phenomenal. And, and that has continued um, to be the trend, you know, where, you know, the absorption rate was 72%, you know, and, and we're talking about, you know, over, over uh, a short period of over uh, just a, a couple months, right? So, so this is, this is, uh, this is very, very big. And another one that Tina has mentioned previously to us, which is um, the Richmond uh, South Delta area. This, um, we joke about it in Vancouver. We regard this area as the largest Chinatown um, in, in the world outside of, of, of China or outside of any uh, Asian uh, only city. So, so Richmond has been the predominant choice for Asian immigrants or any anyone of Asian descent um, because of its um, special, um, you know, co commercial development. Um, it is where the YVR uh, International, Vancouver International Airport is located. So the, the Vancouver International Airport is actually located in the city of Richmond. And, and it has the most um, Chinese restaurant um, per capita, I think definitely anywhere um, in North America and definitely anywhere outside of, of, of China and, um, you know, different cuisine, shopping and, and, and very highly developed public transit um, and, a, and a very well-ran city. So Richmond actually has um, some of the highest um, rental return rates in, in Metro Vancouver um, because of its popularity um, and, and great transit um, through the metropolitan area area to the airport and to all the way to downtown. It only takes about 15 minutes um, on the Canada line of SkyTrain system to go from Richmond by public transit all the way to downtown, which is sort of um, the, the, the start and the end of, of the Metro Vancouver um, city. And, and it's connected to all the schools and, and universities as well. So to talk about some of the projects that we are working on, this is um, Curve um, by Brivia Group, which is um, the largest developer from uh, Montreal. This is going to be the tallest residential high rise um, in Vancouver, and it's going to be the tallest passive house building um, in the world, which is double the height of the current tallest passive house building um, in the world, which is located in uh, New York City as the Cornell University um, Technology Department campus. So this is the most energy efficient and sustainable um, uh, building code in the world, which actually in order to qualify as a, as a passive house um, building, uh, which is very predominant in, in Germany right now, the building has to save a minimum of 95% of, of the energy that is used compared to a conventional building. So the entire building is actually um, you know, airtight and the temperature actually self-regulates itself to the most optimal, let's say, 22 degrees. And, um, you know, ex external um, air conditioning is actually uh, not required because of the temperature self-regulates itself. It's designed by uh, Tom Wright and WKK Architect, which is the same team that has designed and built the Burj Al Arab, um, the seven-star hotel in Dubai. And this is their first um, residential high-rise in, in um, North America. So this is a very, very big um, um, project um, in, in, in Vancouver. And this, you know, think about what the Burj Al Arab has done for Dubai as an international symbol. The curve will do the same for Canada and definitely um, for Vancouver. So if any one of you have um, clients that are interested in Vancouver, particularly in a world, truly world-class building that has, um, you know, that will be a monumental building that, that, that speaks for, um, 
you know, act as a Canadian flag in, in certain ways, um, this is this is the building to look at and um, definitely contact us um, at bakerwest.com and, and the curve.ca to sign up and find out more information. I feel that a lot of the American um, buyers and clients will actually be interested in, in this project, especially the ones in Orange County and, and you know, um, San Francisco and, and LA, uh, because there is a, a very high um, technological aspect of it. And we will also have the tallest um, amenities clubhouse on the 60th floor of the building. So the penthouse level is actually going to be uh, amenities. And we will also have the tallest rooftop um, patio amenities. So these are some other projects that we're doing um, in you know low rise townhomes in the Vancouver West Side market. Um, I won't go into details of these because of time, time constraints, but Revive, it's the first um, Coal form steel, um, uh, low rise uh, stack townhome project in Vancouver. So what that means is conventionally townhomes are built with um, uh, wood frame and and also uh, in concrete. But this one it's it utilized um, with um, the st coal form steel structure. And 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 so this 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 has been a very popular product because steel frame has a much higher um, uh, lifespan and longevity compared to a wood construction, which only has uh, about 75 to 80 years of lifespan, whereas a coal form steel structure has um, um, 500 years minimum. And and going back to the the curve, I mean, I see Colleen's uh, question for the curve. The price point um, have not been decided yet, but but we are looking at being sort of one of the top tier uh, project in Vancouver, being the, the one of the best offerings. And we will be sitting at, um, you know, pretty close to $3,000 per square foot Canadian. And, um, you know, one bedrooms will be, you know, about a, a million dollars or, or up. Um, and then, and then the rest will be very, um, coherent to to um the 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 ongoing active projects in, in downtown this project is actually being launched um at the end of this year so the deposit structure and whatnot it has not fully been that's decided yet but we are looking at probably a 20 percent um down down payment as the deposit so spread over time so maybe 10 percent and then 5% in six months, and then 5% um, in 12 months. So usually that's the predominant uh, de deposit structure for pre-sale um, construction and sales in Vancouver. This is W63. It's a project that's very nearby um, Revive uh, Mid-Rise Condominium um, that it's walking distance to the scratching station. This one is Hudson 8. It's a very unique project in the west side of Vancouver as well. It's a heritage home project. I just want you guys to have, you know, sort of a buffet, you know, of Vancouver and know, you know, what kind of different products we have. So this one is a heritage uh, revitalization um, um, product where uh, and, and a heritage home has been remodeled and got it from the inside to retain the exterior look to keep a, a very affluent um, neighborhood looking, um, you know, the, the same um, and, and be of good representation of Vancouver, but the interior has been all remodeled to uh, modern um, interiors. And beside it, there is a modern duplex um, of, you know, 3,400 square feet each. Um, so you get a juxtaposition of, you know, what the modern um, construction and, and the heritage home is like. And this home is actually um, sort of divided up into three separate homes. So, so on one side, there is um, a, a three-level townhome, and on the other side, there's one, and then there's also one garden home that's one level um, for seniors uh, so that they don't have to go up and down the stairs. And then in the back, there's also three more uh, infill townhome, and it's on a co corner lot of um, Hudson at 57, which is a very prominent um, and sought after residential neighborhood. And this one, it's um, an active project that we're, we're selling and, and completing um, at the end of this year, which is called Sun Towers. It's a very prominent project, literally um, a 30 second walk into uh, the SkyTrain station right here, just across the street. So there's two towers, 
um, about you know 800 units and tower one has been completed and right now we're waiting for a tower two to complete at the end of the year and the price point about for this one it's it's about fourteen hundred dollars per fourteen to fifteen hundred dollars per per square foot so there is a big um, sort of diversity of products so think about you know starting from a thousand dollar per square foot all the way up to three thousand dollars per square foot for the high-end product um and that's the vancouver market and this one it's also a very active project that we have in in richmond called one park this is this is in the largest um chinatown outside of china um in the city of richmond um where it's you know one minute two minute walk from the skytrain station and it comprises of three towers one park uh, the name because it has a fourth level podium um you know with the park and and a cascading design so that to, it increases the outdoor living space for for every unit and we have 31,000 square feet um, amenities and it's right across from richmond center which is the largest shopping center um, in richmond so that's just to go to show you guys the variety of product um, in metro vancouver and now we're up to um, the, the phaser valley so phaser valley it's you know we out here, we, we call it sort of like the suburbs, but people who live in the Fraser Valley actually don't really come out to the Metro Vancouver. So, so they, they, they live there and, and, and it is very prominent and it have its own city centers as well. And in the past two years, the Fraser Valley market has grown dramatically. And I'm talking about, you know, an increase uh, year to year in price, an increase of over 50%, okay? So from let's say a million dollars going to a million and a half, right? Um, for single detached and also for condos and, 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 and multifamily. So it's a very phenomenal market. And the reason for that is because the Metro Vancouver market prices has gone up so drastically and so fast and there's just not enough product and, and, and it has created an affordability issues for the locals. So a lot of people has gone um, to the, the, the Fraser Valley where you can get bigger land, bigger um, units and, and sort of a, a, a more natural environment and lower density for, you know, sort of half the price. So, um, this is the, the active number of listings in the Fraser Valley. Uh, these are resale listings. And you can see the, the supply, okay? The supply number, the monthly supply, it's the high rise um, listings only has enough for one month supply. So what that means is that no new listing come on, um, the high rise supply will dry up in one month. It will be all sold and same goes for the low rise and townhomes, which which is more of a predominant market in the Fraser Valley, which is about two months still less than two months supply and and there the allocation of the different product um, it's quite spread out one third each and this is the average uh, cost per square foot so the Fraser Valley we're still seeing the low thousand dollar per square foot market which is which is um very you know considered as a more affordable market in in greater vancouver and the dom means the days on market so the average listing that gets put on market it's actually sold within 23 days and that's the longest for high rise product and and you have low rise that are going to be sold for within like two weeks right and these are the average prices so um that's the that this, that's the surrey central um um numbers and this is the the right rock i mean um whoever wants a copy of this presentation which has actually a lot of detailed information um send me an email um jackie at bakerwest.com ask for my uh, i'll just type it down here before i forget and and we will we will get this presentation for you so that you know you can you can study it um, in in more details. And this is the Right Rock Surrey um, um, South Surrey Right Rock Market, um, which you can you can see the days on market is also you know quite within one month period, and and there's not a lot of supply here. 
And these are just um, some of the low rise project. I won't, I won't go into it. This one is in Abbotsford High Street and this one it's the Hive. So these are the typical projects that you will see um, in the Fraser Valley, more low, low rises, wood, wood frame product um, on the affordable side. And then we talk about the interiors uh, for the Okanagan. So this is the interior and Kelowna, it's right here. Okay, so it's about um, a four and a half to five hour drive um, from Vancouver to Kelowna. And it's um, about, you know, a short flight or helicopter ride to Kelowna. It's a very, very um, um, popular destination um, because it has 40 of Canada's top wineries. So think Napa Valley, but with... Um, um, the warmest lakes in Canada. So we, we call it the lake, the lake country um, in, in the Okanagan. It's ranked on uh, the number two list of the best small cities in Canada. Um, and it's the top three emerging markets um, just from this year. And it's the fastest growing uh, metropolitan area in Canada. And we have seen an increase of 14% since uh, 2016 by uh, Stats Canada. Um, and, you know, it has amazing tourism because it has some of the warmest lakes in, in Canada. Um, it's, it's closest, um, you know, to the border. And there's a lot of water activity, wick boarding, wick serving, fishing, um, you name it. And there's also really good skiing as well. Um, and the good thing about Kelowna is because it has such a big tourism um, component, it has basically a 0% vacancy. So if anyone's looking for an investment property that it's a recreational property that they will come up, you know, for a week or a month or a couple, couple of weeks during the year, this is the best place to invest in because um, it has the highest um, um, uh, low vacancy, lowest vacancy rate, um, basically in all of BC. And it has some of the highest uh, short-term rental rates, you know, with the Airbnbs and things like that. You, you can rent out, you know, a, a regular single detached family home for, you know, two, 3000 bucks a night. Okay. And, 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 and so the, some of these numbers even surpass um, the short-term rental rates of even Beverly Hills, um, uh, California. So, so it's, it, it's quite amazing. And, um, you know, these are the, the prices, current rental rates. These are actually the monthly rental rates, but um, because the daily rental rates are so high, we have seen actually full on businesses that has been started that actually leases out um, units for long term and then subleasing that them back out at at, at a, a short term rental on the daily rentals at you know two one hundred fifty to you know five hundred bucks a night and 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 running an entire business based on that. So based on the current market trends and rental demands, um, it's estimated that the rental rates will increase by fifteen percent per year, and um, at uh, the bench with the benchmark price being half a million dollars, um, increasing um, by 20% year over year, and and selling you know less than a month per year, and we'll we'll see the the price escalation continue to increase um, by by 20% per per annum. So these are some of the projects that we have. Um, in Kelowna that we are we are currently selling right now. I mean, there there's a lot of information about these projects that I, I really, I don't think I should go into details with, but um, these are, as you can see, these are a lot of like resort style uh, recreational properties with swimming pool, full on amenities. Um, this is Skywater. Um, this is this is Lakeview Village. Um, this is One Water Street, which is the highest end uh, concrete high rise in in the heart of Kelowna, with the walking steps to um, the the marina, um, which we're we're also working closely with our sister company Sotheby's um, International Realty um, to to work on. And this is One Far City, which is which is uh, a growing area. This is a different 
area from downtown uh, Kelowna, which is uh, basically the, um, the university district, right? The university neighborhood where a lot of the extension of the university campus are in. And the rental rates in this area, it's insane because of all the influx of, of students and, and it's very quickly um, developing. So if any of you want um, more information about these recreational properties um, or, or relocation or retirement properties, there's a huge retirement and relocation population in Kelowna as well. And don't, don't forget um, about the wineries. And we're talking about like very high, like Mission Hill, Cedar Creek, Phantom Creek. I mean, uh, um, Quails Gate, um, 55 Parallel. I mean, very, very well-known um, wineries are all in um, the Okanagans. And, you know, last but not least, we talk about the Vancouver Island. Okay, so um, this is one of the biggest um, islands um, in, in North America, actually one of the biggest islands in the world um, that, that it's um, very habitable. And um, it is where our capital, Victoria, it's, it's located at right here. So um, we have the island realm in the Vancouver Island. It's the third most expensive city to rent a two bedroom apartment in Canada. So that means rental returns, um, investment returns for your clients. I won't go over these you know, particular numbers. I mean, all it is, it's in a nutshell, rental rate increase, price increase, <laughs> decrease, of, <laughs> decrease of supply, and uh, it, it, it just continues to do so. And you can see here increased by almost 30%, you know, to uh, 650,000 with the benchmark price um, up, up from um, uh, May of, of um, this year. So, and these are just some of the stats with the different um, cities in terms of their sales data. And these are two of the active projects that um, currently going on in Oak Bay and um, in Centennial Court. And then we just sold um, actually a massive project called One Bear Mountain, um, which has about 650 units. And it only took us um, you know, about uh, two to three months to, to reach the critical uh, pre-sale requirements, like 65, 70%, um, massive project in, um, in, in, in Victoria. And these are some of the prominent developers um, that that you guys may or may not recognize. You know, Aspect Aspect Developments. It's actually part of Sun Hong Cape Properties. It's their Canadian division. Um, Sun Hong Cape Properties in Hong Kong. It's it's the largest um, real estate developer in the world by market capital, and um, they are very heavily involved in um, in Canada as well. And then you'll see some of these names: Boza Properties, Brevia Group, Concord Pacific. West Bank development. Some of you might know West Bank because West Bank do have um, a whole bunch of projects going on in California, um, San Francisco, San Diego um, as well. And, and Boza properties and Boza developments have a, a big um, um, dominance in um, San Diego as well. So just, just so that you guys can get familiarized. Um, these are just some pictures of projects um, that are happening or has been developed or currently being built in Vancouver. Um, just to show you guys sort of the caliber of the architecture. Um, this, this one is Alberni by Kengo Kuma, which is um, by the most famous architect Kengo Kuma from Japan, who, who also was commissioned to design the, the Olympic Stadium. This is the butterfly um, by uh, the late Bing Tom. And our curved building is gonna be right beside the butterfly here. Um, sitting in the dead center of downtown. So there's going to go a, a 60 story building there. This is the, the ARC um, development in Yale Town, Vancouver, um, which has the tallest residential high rise glass bottom swimming pool um, in North America. So this just goes to show you guys like the caliber of um, real estate that that we have in Vancouver as a real world class offering um, for your colleagues and and also for for your clients um, in the states. And these are just some industry photos. You know, th this is myself uh, with with some of the big, biggest developers in, in 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 Vancouver. Just to show you guys that 
real estate is a very fun industry in Vancouver. is is very well respected, and uh, uh, as 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 we develop, um, you know, these amazing buildings, um, we also make a lot of friends and and um, you know, lifelong relationships. And I definitely hope to do that. Uh, together with you guys. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you so much, Tina. I see that you turn your um, screen back on and I'll stop sharing for a moment here. Thank you so much, Jackie. And again, uh, let's see if we have any questions uh, for you. But one thing I want to comment is always, um, I always said it to myself is that populations and real estate and politics are all hand in hand. And, you know, it's just, they, they, they're so, uh, cannot be separated, okay? So when, because uh, Canada has this huge population, the immigrants, the uh, door wide open, uh, the immigration is only one number that we're looking at. Then we have a gazillion amounts of international students here with the international student program that after they stay here, uh, after they finished, and uh, then they will be uh, able to spend three years, get a job, and then get the PR. So, and plus the work permit. So, it's not talking about just four hundred thousand immigrants that we're having. is is very much so. We have the international students, the refugees. You know, like we have a lot of. Uh, I think, um, if I remember correctly, I think we're the second largest uh, Ukrainians uh, populations in in the world, you know, having Ukrainians here. So yes. uh, our court is wide, wide open. And we do, we have shortage, uh, we have a housing shortage. And that's the reason why the government comes up with all this uh, crazy, you know, to you is like unbelievable uh, policy. And then trying to curve the international people coming unless they, you know, are here to have, you know, really gonna stay here or they have the kids here and a working permit here or else we simply do not have enough housing. And we went through that yesterday that, you know, like uh, to, to have a new construction, you know, from a low rise, a townhouse and things like that to a high rise, like what Jackie is, is a marketing right now, you know, like the tallest building in, you know, in the city, that will cost, you know, takes between five to eight years before anybody can move the body in there. So, and then, you know, like, that's what I'm saying is that is a lot of the time, uh, you know, like our city is, is you know, uh, is very limited on the price. Now, in the comparing to U.S., uh, U.S. and uh, at least U.S., you have 50 states. OK, uh, California, you have all this uh, information, uh, you know, like uh, great, you know, a lot of the rich people, they're going to California. But you do have a lot of more choices than us. We only have four big provinces. <laughs> and then mainly people go to Ontario and British Columbia, obviously right now because of the price point, they, you know, people, they go to Ottawa, they go to Quebec, and then they go to Alberta, but we only have 10 provinces and four major uh, pro uh, big provinces, and the rest of it, you know, like a smaller one. And that's the reason why I thank you, Jackie, today to share, you know, like I under we understand that not, um, uh, not all Americans will buy in like Surrey or, or White Rock and, 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 and areas like that. But it gives you a good perspective and overview of, you know, yes, uh, the high demand is in the city of Vancouver. And that's the reason why they come, uh, you know, just like any politician, they're trying to curb something and trying to make the, you know, the price can be a little bit more affordable, but you know, like affordability does not happen in Canada. <laughs> so unfortunately, but anyway, uh, really appreciate uh, Jackie's your insight. And, uh, you know, before we move on, uh, I don't see any questions on the chat box, but you have Jackie's uh, uh, email, then you can go to uh, contact him directly. And uh, before we move on, so I would like to uh, take time, you know, to thank Jackie and Richard once again uh, for being with us uh, today and, uh, and share with all this. And lastly, but not the least, ARIA Vancouver President um, Justin, I would like to introduce you and then, you know, give us a little bit of our November 6th. I mean, in case some of you are not here yesterday, but we're going to have a quick update uh, on what is going on. It's our 10th year's anniversary, and we have a lot of, uh, you know, uh, a public event. So, Justin, the floor is yours. Thank you. 
thank you very much, Tina. Wow, what a wealth of knowledge that was. Thank you all to the presenters. That's great information. Um, welcome everybody to the day two of our road trip today. We are so excited to, and honored to have your attendance. My name is Justin Lee of Century 21 in Town Realty. I am a residential real estate advisor as well as a rental property manager. Also Ari Vancouver Chapters president. So nice to meet you and thank you for tuning in. Um, i like you guys to mark your calendars. Uh, we have some really exciting news for you. Uh, November 6th uh, marks our first ever uh, in-person event uh, at the Italian Cultural Center. Aria Vancouver is bringing you Real Expo 2022. Uh, for the first time ever, uh, it's gonna be a public event. It will feature many top uh, local uh, and global real estate leaders. Uh, one of the many speakers who is already on the bill is um, former managing director, uh, chief economist at uh, J.P. Morgan uh, Chase in New York City. Okay, sorry, we uh, went a little bit over ahead there, but uh, anyways, uh, let's go through this one first. Yes, uh, he is our former uh, 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 former managing director, chief economist at J.P. Morgan Chase in New York City. Uh, he appears several times uh, per month on CNBC and is often featured in other media outlets such as uh, Fox Business News, CNN, Reuters, uh, Bloomberg Television, and Nightly Business Reports. So stay tuned uh, to Aria Vancouver as more information is to come out. And if I may ask you, Fong, to uh, go back to um, one more before that. Yes, this one is perfect. Okay, just to give you a little background on uh, what ARIA stands for and who we are, uh, ARIA stands for the Asian Real Estate uh, Association of America. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization first founded in 2003. Uh, our goal is dedicated to promoting sustainable home ownership opportunities in the pan Asian American and Canadian communities by creating a powerful national voice for housing and real estate professionals that serve this uh, dynamic market. For almost two decades now, ARIA events have been known to provide excellent opportunities for networking with peers and practitioners to exchange ideas and to build partnerships and friendships that last a lifetime. Um, it is also an opportunity to interact with experts on hand who can offer creative solutions to the challenges that you face. Next slide, please. With over 17,000 members, over 44 chapters now, uh, Vancouver being one of the two Canadian chapters, the other is Toronto. We have a 10 year anniversary as a chapter uh, that was first founded in 2012 by Miss Tina Mack, our founding and past president. Uh, so to celebrate our uh, 10th year anniversary, um, like I said, we're putting our first ever uh, public event. So uh, I will, I will uh, discuss more in details at the closing of today's program. So just next slide, please. I've had to pick and choose uh, these slides here. There's quite a few to feature, but uh, these are the most recent ones. And uh, at the top right-hand corner right here, we have an installation dinner uh, just before the start of the pandemic. Uh, we've had many uh, in-person events in the past, uh, such as, you know, they've been taking place at the golf clubs and, and Sutton Place Hotel. But until the pandemic began, uh, you know, we were still engaging, but just on a different platform. So we've had to switch over to uh, Zoom over the last few years. The other two selected events here uh, are, are from uh, earlier this year, one of them namely what role does feng shui play within uh, different cultures. Uh, this features several international uh, feng shui specialists such as uh, Do uh, Dr. Lily Chung, uh, Dr. Jin Pei and our very own Jerry King. The other was uh, how to avoid being tax audited featuring CPA uh, Hebron Shing. Uh, is a CPA a veteran. Uh, the, both of these events garnered la large attendance from as far as Hong Kong, all over the US and, and Canada. Also BC Realtors who attended these programs received a uh, PDP credit towards their 18 credit requirement for license renewal. Next slide, please. And just to uh, mention here, yesterday, I'm sure if you've uh, attended day one, uh, you'll notice that Brian Ogmanson, our uh, very own chief uh, uh, economist, was also on board at this event. So make sure you mark your calendars for 
Um, November the 6th, uh, Professor Lee will be here, uh, Brian Ogmanson, as well as Dr. Anthony Chan. So it's gonna be an exciting one. I hope to see you all in person. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, ARIA's membership represents a broad array of real estate, uh, mortgage and housing real related professionals that serve a, uh, the diverse North American market. Memberships include housing and uh, real estate professionals of all cultural backgrounds. So by signing up as a member, uh, BC Realtors will not only receive free PP credits uh, throughout the year for courses that we, uh, we offer, uh, but for everyone else, you'll receive a special membership pricing on events such as the one coming uh, for November the 6th. Uh, so just make sure you follow the instructions on screen. Go to aria.org slash membership dash registration. Select the Vancouver chapter at the drop down menu and then just follow the uh, on screen instructions there. There's perks there such as uh, uh, discounts on hotel stays, uh, discounts on uh, client gifts, uh, anniversary gifts, gifts to yourself or, or whatnot. So um, and that wraps up my part of the program. Thank you all for tuning in. I'm going to hand it uh, right back to you there, uh, Tina. Sorry, it was just a little bit of delayed on my uh, camera and my uh, mic. So thank you so much, Justin. And now we welcome back Joyce uh, to share a few words of closing from uh, Orange County. Joyce. Yes, thank you very much, Tina. Oops. And thank you very much to everyone who joined us today. A big uh, gratitude to Aria Vancouver, um, Tina Mack, and your guests, as well as Kriya, Sharon von Schoenberg, and all of your guests. We really appreciate the collaboration with you for the past two days so that the Orange County Global Business Alliance Committee can present this great tour of Western Canada for our members and all of our friends. Um, we have now set the stage for an in-person uh, trade mission, and hopefully we can maybe do this in 2023, because now we have a great foundation and an idea of what we can uh, see now with our eyeballs since we saw everything on screen. So this is really exciting for especially the Orange County Realtor members. And of course, we're going to open this up to everybody who wishes to join when we are going to be forming a in-person trade mission. Chair Bob Hartman, thank you so much. And Vice Chair Lisa E, thanks to you as well to be our task team leader. And again, to our CEO, Dave Stefanides, um, for his support. Um, a little bit about Orange County Realtors. We are 1,500 plus members strong. We are number one, the number one um, largest uh, real estate organization in California with our membership. And education is one of our pillars. We have about 7,000 members that we touch over the year be it training, office visits, education. And we also have um, broker preview meetings where agents meet. Uh, there's seven meetings a week and there can be anywhere from, uh, from a couple of hundred realtors and affiliates that participate and come together once a week. So we really try and do our best to really serve our members here at Orange County Realtors. Uh, coming up on Friday, July 22nd, will be the culmination of Orange County Realtors Global Business Alliance Committee um, Forum for us. And we will have our California Association of Realtors Deputy Chief Economist, Oscar Way, who will be uh, sharing information and data with California. And he has some very good statistics with California as well as the nation um, regarding international buyers and, um, and statistics on that. So we hope you can join us. Again, that's Friday the 22nd from 1 to 3 p.m. Pacific time. 
And the link will be shared so that everybody will have an opportunity to register for that as well. So again, from the bottom of our hearts, we really um, want to express our gratitude for everyone coming to participate the last two days. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you on Friday too. Thank you and have a great rest of your day. Tina? Thank you, Joyce. Thank you, thank you, Joyce. And I would like to, um, you know, like thanks, uh, Bob, I didn't. I don't think that Bob was with us yesterday. Was I? I, I didn't see it. But uh, anyway, I really appreciate that Bob can be uh, uh, with us today. Uh, you know, Vancouver. You know, is a small. You know, BC is a small place. The whole Canada is only thirty-seven million people, so it's not. You know, it's even smaller than California. So uh, we welcome you. Our door is wide, wide open. And uh, sorry, Bob, I didn't uh, pay attention that you were here yesterday, but I really, really appreciate it and hope to uh, see you in person. And uh, so let's welcome back uh, Sharon from Korea uh, to say a few words about, uh, you know, Korea Global. So Hi, Sharon. everyone. Hi, thanks so much. This has been an awesome two days. Um, I hope everyone uh, can see me okay. It was great learning about the pre-sale um, here at the Canadian Real Estate Association. For those that may be on and weren't on yesterday, we represent over 150,000 realtors across Canada. We are like the NAR of Canada. So we always say we're the little sister of NAR here in Canada. And part of my uh, position is to really promote Canadian real estate and our Canadian realtors by forging these business uh, relationships and sharing opportunities like this. So when Joyce reached out on the virtual trade mission, we jumped right on because um, I've been organizing what we call our great Canadian road trip. So I sort of hijacked yesterday um, and it really served two purposes. And so it was awesome to work with Aria Vancouver and uh, and with Orange County. So I appreciate that opportunity and thank uh, both organizations. And I'll just take a couple of minutes of your time. So if you enjoyed the Great Canadian Road Trip, if you enjoyed this format and you're interested to learn about other places in Canada, we're going to hop our trailer and go all the way across to Central to Ontario in November. And I'll make sure I share those dates out with the Orange County staff and we'd love to have you join us. Very similar format. We'll hear from local realtors. We're going to look at some of the smaller markets in Ontario. We often hear a lot about the Toronto area, but there are some great areas where uh, a lot of U.S. are, are investing um, in, in our sort of lake community, uh, cottage community. So we look forward to showcasing some places maybe you're not as familiar with in that show. Also, um, we do have our CREA Global Affiliate. So here at the Canadian Real Estate Association, we do not have an international member category, but we do have what we call our CREA Global Affiliates, and that opens the the door for those outside of Canada, those realtors that are really uh, looking to increase and build their uh, networking partners in Canada. It's an opportunity for you to join. It's a subscription. It's an annual subscription. You get access to our education, uh, networking, a profile of yourself in the directory. We have a Facebook group um, and also the golden ticket for the Canadian reception at the National Association of Realtors. Uh, we do invite our global affiliates to join us at that and it's uh, attended, well attended by all our Canadians at NAR. And this year in Orlando, we typically, Orlando typically draws the largest percentage of Canadian realtors um, uh, to the NAR conference in previous uh, before COVID, we get about 600 Canadian realtors who make make the journey there to NAR. So we're looking to bring that back as we are coming out, we hope, of the tale of this global pandemic. But you can look at koreaglobal.ca to learn more. And um, finally, just a reminder, realtor.ca is the website portal for Canada. Uh, it's a marketing portal of properties across Canada. It is owned and operated by Korea on behalf of realtors from across Canada. All MLS listings are up uploaded to that site. We're back at about the 240,000 active listings right now from a low of 150,000 in pandemics and slowly making our way to the typically on average, you'd see about 350,000 properties. So just like elsewhere in the world, there is a supply uh, problem, but it's slowly building up. So as I said, we're about oh, just over 240,000. So you can check that out and you can always reach me at global uh, at korea.ca. I'll put that in the chat as well as my direct email um, if you have any questions or are looking to connect. So again, I, I thank for this opportunity and uh, wish everyone, everyone a great day as well. So back to you, Tina. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, uh, are we having our uh, networking time? There is still time. Yes, I would suggest we do. 
And uh, uh, would any, because uh, we had some good time yesterday, and then the people they are in and interested in it, and uh, you know, like we can we can have our uh, next eight minutes, you know, or or seven minutes, uh, to do that. So uh, I'll let you control how that works because I have no idea. <laughs> So in the event, in case I didn't come back, like yesterday I was lost, I, I, I didn't, I wasn't able to come back. Uh, thank you so much, everybody. And I uh, love to, uh, you know, it's been my pleasure to be your MC today and hope to see you uh, or many of you or some of you in, uh, uh, you know, San Diego and, uh, and absolutely uh, November 6th, if you are, you know, like interested in coming, it is going to be a rainy, uh, Vancouver. However, you know, you can go skiing and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, please share with us and uh, stay tuned. Uh, we'll get you more information uh, through uh, Korea and, you know, like through a lot of different channels uh, to, uh, to, uh, to join us on November 6th in Vancouver. Thank you so much.